the uh, this is the Dharma talk on the first full day of Workaday Sashin in May of 2021. <clears throat> and we're we're concentrating in this uh, Sashin on the teachings of Tori Zenji. Um, it's Sashin is a time to deepen our practice and also to do some study of the uh, of the culture, the history, and the variety of teachings and teachers that have been part of this very, very long tradition, two and a half millennia of human beings. So, and we're part of it too. We're here, we are in the, uh, the first full day of Sashin. Uh, started this morning in the quiet early hours uh, with our full attention for an hour um, that started the day off. And I, I wonder uh, if you noticed any differences as you went through your daily round. In other way, in, other than it being Sashin, it's kind of an ordinary day. And uh, what, what uh, we can right from the start notice any, any effects of a slightly longer morning sit uh, some of us do that on a more regular basis and some not. So you can notice what, what you noticed. Folding our ordinary day's routine into Sashin is sometimes difficult, um, but usually it's also really well worth the effort. It's unusual. It's an unusual way to practice, um, to practice Sashin being able to approach work as Samu, a full day of Samu. Uh, so our life in the Zen spirit is part of the gift of this particular practice. Many of the classical koans arose from the situation where there are practitioners in the midst of their daily rounds who, uh, who encounter some kind of obstacle or question. And um, koan is, means public case. So it's, it's stories told of these exchanges between uh, students of the way and people who have been practicing for longer and have their hopefully Dharma eye a bit opened, a bit more open than the student. Um, <clears throat> the koan approach that we inherit comes to us from, um, well, early on, but was systematized by uh, Hakuin Eikaku in uh, Japan, who is the great reorganizer and restorer of Rinzai Zen in Japan. Though many of the koans come from our, our uh, stories about Chinese practitioners and masters. So the Japanese inherited them and then added their own. Just as in recent times, we have a number of new modern uh, koan collections, which seem a lot simpler just because they are in our own cultural garb, uh, but they, they attend to the same questions that we have about the nature of our life. So um, we in our lineage are in it much more, we are in a mixed lineage of uh, Soto Rinzai uh, and um, but we follow more the spirit of Soto Zen, which is more gentle and gradual and doesn't necessarily work with classical koan curriculum, although sometimes we bring that in. Uh, but Rinzai Zen ha is, is marked by a, uh, an approach that involves uh, sudden enlightenment, uh, an emphasis on um, on a flash of awakening, a flash of insight. Uh, and it has contributed a really rich literature uh, as well as the spirit of koan, which is kind of the, the way that we approach it is, what are the issues and questions in our own life that are not answerable by a yes or a no or a this or a that. But we have to live into these situations to get more insight into what the most essential matter is in them, in our lives. So one of Hakuin Zenji's heirs was Tore Zenji. And his story is worth noting. It's, it's very, uh, 
uh, well, I will read it to you. Um, he had to overcome a lot of karmic obstacles uh, to, uh, to offer his dharma, a dharma that comes through, through him all the way down to us. Here we are now receiving his dharma. So Tari Zenji was, um, was um, born in 1721 and, and he, he died in 1792. So he died at the age of 71. Um, and he, he was a major contributor to um, Hakuin's ability to reorganize and restore Rinzai Zen. In his uh, discourse to the inexhaustible lamp of the Zen school, he tells us his story. And so now I'll share a bit of the opening of that. And I wanna show you um, just so that you're aware of the, uh, the heft, this is, this is the size of it, okay? This is his um, discourse on the inexhaustible lamp of the Zen school. So he says, though I had completed the training and come to maturity, I had not yet attained freedom in the old master's wonder arousing mysterious state behind the differentiation of all things. So I went into retreat at the west side of Kyoto's Shirakawa River and there practiced austerities day and night for more than a hundred days. So he went into a three month retreat. What I had vowed had already been attained, but I nevertheless continued heedless, heedlessly and with my efforts exceeding all caution, the five organs were overstrained and I fell seriously ill. This is one of a number of stories of, of masters who really made themselves incredibly sick by the profound effort that they were expending. It also tells us something about their uh, desperation and personalities. And there's something very useful about desperation in Zen practice. Uh, one of my early teachers, uh, Cohen, um, uh, Rick Roshi uh, used to say that you have to be desperate to practice Zen, which I thought was really interesting. I could, I could relate. I was rather desperate when I came across the her. So I, um, back to, uh, back to um, Tori Zenji. I did my best to effect a cure, but to no avail. The disease got worse. And three times I was laid down suffering as if all the illnesses of the world afflicted me. Off and on, it lasted for three years. The doctor wrung his hands and said, even if you should recover, you have only a few more years to live. This made me think. It was not that I held my, my own life dear but I could not resign myself to not having accomplished the vow to benefit myself and others, and that all my efforts and sufferings had been in vain. Pondering, I remembered Master Choho, who wrote a treatise while awaiting execution. Deciding to follow his example, I started writing this treatise. So this is the beginning of his introduction. Though bed bound, I kept brush and ink by my side and wrote whenever I could. Within just 30 days, the rough copy was ready. Here it is. <laughs> what a guy, huh? Um, and I called it the inexha inexhaustible lamp of our school showing how from one lamp, hundreds of thousands of lamps are kindled, inexhaustible from one to the other. After that, I became calm, spending my remaining days sitting up or lying down as my condition demanded. Occasionally, there came days when I felt better. After about six months, I knew by myself that I would live. I had decided that in case I should not recover, I would have this treatise presented to the Roshi, who was a Hakuin Zenji. 
If parts of it were judged worth keeping, it might act as an incentive for later students. If not, I would ask for it to be burnt. But as I now was certainly recovering and in process of regaining, regaining normal health, I wondered what use there was for such dead tangles. I was about to burn it myself, but just then I received a kind letter from the Roshi telling me to come and see him. Uh, and he does, he's very modest. He doesn't mention that the, the uh, invitation that the Roshi sent him, this is, um, this is uh, Hakuin Zenji, who was a very great Zen master, gave him transmission. He called him to his room in the middle of the night and gave him transmission which was, is quite, a, quite a, uh, an honor and a recognition of the depth of Torre's insight and the confidence that uh, Hakuin had in his ability to carry on the Dharma full strength and pass it on. But what, what uh, Torre says is, after having seen him in the San Zen room, we talked and this treatise was mentioned. The master looked through it and told me that it would be useful for later students and that I was not to burn it. So I kept it stored away for a long time. Now, upon repeated requests from various followers, I was obliged to give in and agree to have it published. But written words can be a source of entanglement as well as of liberation. Unless the right person takes it at the right time, the elixir turns to poison. Please be careful and do not take another's insight as your own. If you deviate from this stern injunction, you miss my intention. On account of my protracted illnesses, I was unable to do any revision. How could such a book become a standard text? Time will decide. It was written by Fufuan Enji, and that was his literary name, in September, 1750 at the country house called Mumon in Asakusa, Usashi province. So that's, that's the story of the writing of his, his uh, major work that we will be looking into and out of which his Bodhisattva vow comes. He clearly states in this, his desire that all his effort and sufferings be of benefit not only to himself, but to others, huh? And that it be an incentive, that it inspire later students. And here we are, 400 years later, helping Tori Zenji realize his vow to help his complete enlightenment unfold through time and space, through our practice. This is what's meant when we, when we say those grand words is, it, it, this is the way the vow keeps going. So the inexhaustible lamp of the Zen school lays out Zen training in Japan. Uh, the treatise goes through step by step what Zen training is about, why it is as it is, and uh, sets out the stages of the development of insight, all of which need to be fully explored and realized for ourselves before Dharma is fully opened. His discourse is a passionate plea to give ourselves completely to practice and to continue with its full, uh, with its full practice until our full realization, where the training has penetrated in the very, into the very marrow of our bones. It's a phrase that's often used, marrow, all the way down to the, where the blood is formed, the blood of the Dharma. We've got it in our body and in our mind and in our heart, genuine, not dependent on words or anyone else's words. He says, seeing just once, uh, one's true nature is not enough. But I want to add, but it is important. Uh, the Tibetans say, one of the Tibetan teachers say, the most important moment in a person's life is the moment 
when uh, the arising of the thought of enlightenment occurs. And what that means to me is when we have an inkling of wholeness, of peace, deep peace in our heart. But he says, seeing just once into one's true nature is not enough. Dedicated effort and sustained determination after awakening are necessary until insight has become familiar and available and can be used freely in all situations. So there's the, there's the, uh, the work of, so this is kind of the outline of Zen practice. There's the work up until you kind of get what, what this is all about, but the most more, much more important than that is after, after enlightenment, it comes the, the very minute unfolding of how this works in every moment of our life, how the Dharma unfolds until insight is familiar, is our way of life and available and can be used freely when needed and as needed. So what are the stages that he sets out in each of the chapters? The first one, I'm just gonna talk about the first one tonight, is titled The Source of Zen. And when I saw this title, I thought that he was gonna describe the history, dates, people, content, etc. But what he does is far more to the point of Zen. He begins by telling the story of the first seven steps that the Buddha took at his birth. And he says, when the all enlightened world honored one first came into the world, he took seven steps to indicate the four directions and one hand pointing to heaven and one to earth uttered a lion's roar between heaven and earth, I alone and the world honored one. And Tor Tori Zenji's comment on this, he writes this out and then he writes, bah, exclamation mark. This is very promising. <laughs> He's not interested in symbolism and in grand language, language, but the real steps. He says, an ordinary child can't do this. It's a mythic story about the nature of experience, yours and mine. We need the eye of Zen in this very moment to receive the deeper teaching of this story. And our life, the deeper teaching of our life, the deeper truth of our life, which goes beyond, uh, for all of us, the ordinary language about it. Language is just the surface description of what, what lives in, in a lively way in our direct experience. Um, so uh, Torre, at the very outset of his discourse, let us know that he's unrelenting in his determination to transmit to us the true authentic Dharma eye that we're all practicing to open that goes beyond principle in concepts and words and straight to the fundamental vehicle of present moment openness, which is fresh and complete just as it is any moment, every moment. It's an all at onceness teaching all at once, everything comes forward together. Like that's the characteristic of reality. It's always complete. There's not a hair's breadth gap in the present moment. Bodhidharma says simply of the same thing, many know the way and few walk it. We uh, embody the true Dharma. We don't just talk about it. He urges us to keep going beyond words and letters and concepts and principles. And then he says, your heart may be wide and free when quietly by yourself and your very body may feel spacious. Yet you tense up when meeting others and experience stress and difficulties. This is because your training and practice are still insufficient, are not yet fully embodied. 
So he, he's just describing exactly our, our condition and our situation and the challenge that we all face with this. Rinzai practice as system, uh, systematized by Hakuin and Torre stresses Kensho, which is um, sudden breakthrough awakening experiences. Uh, and, and this is experienced uh, through persistent and thorough practice. Sometimes these awakening experiences happen quite spontaneously for people who don't even practice. And it can be very disruptive, actually. Um, very disruptive. If you don't have a context for understanding uh, a, an experience where all of the usual ways of identifying up and down and in and out disappear. So huge opening, huge Ken shows are not necessarily a good thing to have, but most people want one that you, you figure, oh, I just want to have a big awakening and then I'll be free. It's not actually the way it usually goes, unless you have been practicing for a long time. And if that's the case, you've probably had many, many, many small openings. So um, it's not a matter of um, counting, you know, it's not, that's not what it's about. So um, let's see, where was I? Yeah, so, so opening the Dharma eye is not a, uh, it's not about intellectual understanding or scholarship, which is always interesting to those of us who find it interesting, but it's not necessary. Um, but it, the, uh, the opening is, it happens when uh, reasoning is exhausted and the words fail. When you see into your true nature, into the true nature of everything, the restlessly questing heart calms down and everything drops off. It's not so hard. It's not, nothing has to be so hard anymore. With Kensho, whatever swims into view, which we talk about as the relative world of form, objects and things, it's seen in its true nature. The direct open uh, mind is revealed quite naturally when we leave aside the thinking mind and dive directly into experience itself. One reason why we love to do what we love to do, you know, biking, swimming, gardening, is it's, it's whatever form lets us completely put aside all the, the, the mind that separates and we just join completely wholeheartedly into whatever we're doing. Singing, dancing, riding our bike. Terry Zenji wrote a poem. Ah, the frog, the very strength he jumped in with is also the strength that buoys him up, that buoys him up. There is one life, moment by moment. There's always just one life unfolding, impermanent, interdependent, and truly wondrous beyond the knowing of ordinary mind. So I want to share another story that he he goes into in this chapter. Excuse me. Um, and you probably are familiar with it, where Buddha holds up a flower, and the only one in the assembly to really get the teaching is Mahakashyapa, who smiles. Everyone else is a bit baffled. You may know that feeling when it comes to Zen. I certainly have known that feeling when it comes to Zen many times. <laughs> so here's uh, Tori Zenji's version of that story. He says, Buddha's teaching is very deep, hard to fully comprehend. He nevertheless always has something more. And here Tori Zenji is about to go well beyond our ordinary sensibility to mobilize wonder and great doubt 
And he, he's repeating the story from the Flower Garland Sutra, which is uh, kind of like a, um, an acid trip. It's an amazing book. If ever you, you want to pick up something that's going to blow your mind about uh, Buddhism, Flower Garland Sutra is really quite remarkable. So this comes from that. Brahma went to Spirit Mountain, presented a gold flower to Buddha, then sacrificed his body to be a chair. That Buddha, uh, pleading that Buddha expound the truth to the multitudes gathered there. Buddha sat on the seat of that chair and held up the flower. No one, people or deities, knew what to make of this. You can imagine what that, what just happened. There's Brahma, who's the, the god of the whole universe, and he sacrificed himself to become a chair while he's pleading with the Buddha to, um, to expound the truth. No one, people or deities, knew what to make of this. There was a golden-faced ascetic in the crowd who alone broke into a smile. The world-honored one said, I have this treasury of the eye of truth, which I entrust to the elder Kasyapa. So Kasyapa could see that it was just being demonstrated. The, the truth of Dharma, of impermanence, of interdependent arising, of, no, of, of uh, interchangeable time and space, was all being demonstrated. So in his chapter on the source of Zen, we travel in the many realms of direct experience. Uh, it's a long chapter, it's filled with stories. The ordinary and the dreamlike nature of our experience blend as it does when we pay really close attention to the reality, our reality, our experience when it is not impeded by our thinking mind, our habituated way of limiting what we let in and what we notice. You may have had some of these experiences where you're not sure well, what, what is this? Toward the end of the chapter in which he lays out a variety of methods that the Buddha taught with, Tari Zenji is asked a question why didn't the Buddha teach Zen first instead of expounding so many doctrinal principles? That's a really good question. His answer, when the Buddha first emerged in the world, people, people's faith was as yet immature. And in India, there were countless other paths each with different doctrines and all sorts of misunderstandings. Just like now, today. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. Thousands of years ago and thousands of miles away and millions of other people involved. But today we have all of these different spiritual paths that are offered and at our fingertips anytime at websites and podcasts and books and magazines and our friends who are going to this retreat and that workshop, right? And it's true that Zen is not for everybody. It takes a certain tolerance uh, for uncertainty and inquiry to be free enough from obscurations and hindrances to be able to sit with one's own mind and heart without freaking out or turning away. Uh, we had a, uh, you know, we've all felt, I think we've all felt this at some point or other. It was like, ah, get me out of here. We had a, <laughs> uh, years ago when we were still at the yoga center, uh, one Sunday morning, we had a couple of, uh, I guess they were college students. They were pretty young, sit. And we took them through the orientation and then we began the set. And um, about 10 minutes in, they just stood up and screamed and said, get me out of here. And they ran out the door and everybody was uh, just raucously laughing because we, we could all identify with, <laughs> with that experience. 
So, you know, those of us who are not, uh, are not cowed by that impulse, <laughs> um, we persist because there is something, there's something to this. Um, we all do it in our own ways. Uh, we all do our own freak out to a lesser extent, right? Uh, we all feel restlessness and judgment and doubt and desire and sloth and all the things that get in the way of being settled. We all have these, but are able to work with them enough to sustain our gaze over time and to see through the mists of concept and impression and habit and impulse long enough for our wisdom eye to see and our actions to align with this clear light. It's hard to put into words what this is. And many people, myself included, uh, for a long time when you start to do Zen practice, you don't really want to tell anybody about it because you don't even really know what to say about it, right? Um, so this is the light of Bodhi mind emanating from a wisdom so deep that we may need to make our way through layers and layers of difficult karma to tap. But in the meantime, faith is what carries us long in the direction of awakening. And we'll be looking at uh, what Tori said about this in tomorrow night's Dharma talk, faith, an inkling, however small in intuition, however it gets our attention, is all that it takes. An inkling of possibility, a taste of Zen, refreshing, inspiring, and subtly simple, mysteriously radiant is how it's described in his um, Bodhisattva vow. Mysterious radiance. In this practice, we travel in awareness as the vehicle to where everything in our material culture is pointing away from, we go in the direction of. Our great Buddhist vehicle, our, our great, the great vehicle of the Mahayana takes us only so far along the road. And then Zen points beyond the road into what is wide open and infinitely vital. Dropping everything. And that's what, that's what Tori Zenji is urging us to do. Drop everything. To taste the freedom of this wide open, infinitely vital life. And then he says, Zen directly tests the truth of enlightenment. That's a hefty statement. Uh, so it's something we can all ponder. Zen directly tests the truth. And actually that's part of the, the Zen method. That's one reason why you you know, you have insights and you study with a teacher if you really want to keep going in the practice because you want somebody to help you test and look at and shift and you see it this way and they can point it out in a different way and you just keep, keep testing until you can see all the way through anything that catches you up. So... This is an intro to Tori Zenji, who, who put together this Bodhisattva vow, which we will now chant. Let's do it. Tori Zenji's Bodhisattva vow. Disciples, when I humbly observe the true nature of things, 
All are the marvelous manifestation of the Tathagata's truth. Atom by atom, instant by instant, all are none other than this mysterious radiance. Because of this, our virtuous ancestors extended loving care and reverence toward even such beings as birds and beasts. How then can we be but humbly grateful for the food, drink, and clothing that nourishes and protects us throughout the day, these being in essence the warm skin and flesh of the great masters, the incarnate compassion of the Buddha. If it is so, even with inanimate objects, how much more should we be kind and merciful towards human beings, even those who are foolish? Though they become our sworn enemies, reviling and persecuting us, we should regard them as bodhisattva manifestations who in their great compassion are employing skillful means to help emancipate us from the twisted karma we have produced over countless kalpas through our biased self-centered views. If we awaken in ourselves this deep, pure faith, offering humble words and taking sincere refuge in the Buddha, then with every thought there will bloom a lotus flower, each with a Buddha. These Buddhas will establish pure lands everywhere and reveal the radiance of the Tathagata beneath our very feet. May we extend this mind throughout the universe so that we and all sentient beings may equally bring to fruition the seeds of wisdom. Our prayer uh, is that any goodness generated here be extended out into the world. May all places be held sacred. May all beings be cherished. May all injustices of oppression and devaluation be fully righted, remedied, and healed. May all wounds to forests, rivers, deserts, oceans, all wounds to Mother Earth be lovingly restored to bountiful health. May all beings everywhere delight in whale song, bird song, and blue sky. May all beings abide in peace and well being, awaken and be free. So, if you need to, uh, to take five minutes and stretch, uh, we will resume.